Thank you so much. Uh, let me start off by just uh, really congratulating and commending everybody at Channel 4, senior leadership levels and uh, in every position that's uh, kind of taken it upon themselves to start reporting on their own diversity targets. Let me congratulate the Minister on his uh, introduction of the Diamond Scheme. Hopefully it'll uh, lead other broadcasters to up their game and also start reporting on some of these diversity targets that I know we all agree are so important. Um, Something just popped into my head when I was watching that. I remember the 2012 um, ad campaign on Channel 4 for the Paralympics. Do you remember that? The Superhumans one. Well, I'm tearing up just thinking about it, actually. Um, my, uh, my aunt was disabled, or is, I know a lot of disabled people like to be called otherly abled, and um, I wish she got to see that ad, because, it, it, you know, for me, she was a superhuman. Um, I know we're all gathered here to address some really important, pressing, urgent questions. And I think chief among those really pressing, urgent questions, both in your mind and in mine, is what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> or in, uh, in an age where reality TV stars can become American presidents, perhaps our typically restrained British equivalent is to just let an actor address politicians. Uh, I promise to leave my political ambitions there, although as a British Muslim socialist creative type, I can't root out a leadership bid for UKIP at some point in the future. Uh, they, I mean, these are topsy-turvy political times. You never know which way things are going to go. I mean, uh, like it or not, and more than we'd probably like to let on, there's, there's a lot more that actors and politicians, uh, creatives and those in government have in common. Disproportionately, perhaps for better, and some would say worse, we both have a big hand in shaping culture. And we both do that the same way, by telling stories. Now, as a lot of the politicians in the room might know, it's sometimes uh, the most fantastical and unrealistic stories that make the biggest impact. But even in those stories, what people are looking for is a message that they belong, that they're part of something, that they are seen and heard, and that despite, or perhaps because of the uniqueness of their experience, they are valued. They want to feel represented. That's really what we do. That's what we have in common. That's the game we're in. We're here to represent. It's that simple. And in that task, it pains me to say, we have failed. It's been a noble failure. We've been taking large strides in the right direction, sometimes a bit slower than we'd like, sometimes a bit too incremental, sometimes not really seizing the ball by its horns, but we have fallen short of the mark. And when we fail to represent, people switch off. They switch off on telly, they switch off at the ballot box, and they retreat to other fringe narratives, which are sometimes very dangerous. Now, everywhere the old order is in flames, right? Whether in film and television with the advent of streaming and a globalized marketplace, or whether at the ballot box with the ascendance of uh, populism, some people like to call it. Whether we like it or not, a new national story is being written right now about who we are. The story we tell to ourselves and that we tell to the world about who we are, as Britain tries to redefine its place in the world, really matters. Will it be a story that looks inwards and backwards? Will it be a story that looks outwards and ahead to the future? As thousands of qualified doctors and nurses huddle on our shores as refugees, do we spot a threat or an opportunity? When Nollywood explodes and China dominates the international box office, do we think, okay, too much competition, let's retreat back to our tried and tested formula of all-white period drama, or do we spot an opportunity in these global developments? Do we have a look at the multicultural gold mine that we're sitting on and spot an opportunity? We're in search of a new national story. It needs updating. The old one stopped making sense to people. It stopped giving meaning to the complex reality and the new realities that they're facing. And I'm here to ask for your help. I'm here to ask for your help in finding a new national story that embraces and empowers as many of us as possible, rather than excluding us and alienating large sections of the population. In this, whether we like it or not, we need each other. Now, what's at stake? I just want to take a, a moment to kind of reframe what we're talking about. 
what's at stake here? I mean, in this age of populism, it can sometimes seem like talking about diversity is kind of swimming against the current, going against the grain. It's, it's political correctness gone mad and all that kind of thing, right? It's, a, it's an added extra. It's a frill. It's a luxury. That's what diversity can sound like. The, the very phrase actually turns me off a little bit. It sounds like there's a, there's a core, a benchmark against which everything is measured. And then there's a little bit of something you could sprinkle on top. A little bit of salt, a little bit of spice. It's uh, something you can live with, but you can also live without. And to me, that really doesn't put into focus how crucial what we are talking about really is. We're talking about representation, not diversity. Representation is not an added extra. It's not a frill. It's absolutely fundamental to what people expect from culture and from politics. What's at stake isn't just whether or not um, I get the next acting role I want, although that would be nice. What, what do you want? Uh, well, it would be nice if they had a Star Wars prequel, actually. <laughs> <laughs> What's really at stake here is much, much bigger than that. After the Brexit vote, hate crimes went up 41%. Against Muslims, they went up 326%. In the 1930s, we had a very similar situation to what we have today. Political polarization, economic disenfranchisement after a big financial crash, rising inequality, systematic scapegoating of certain minorities. What's at stake here is whether or not we will move forwards together or whether we will leave people behind. That's what's at stake if we don't step up and represent. Now, if we fail to represent, I think we're in danger of losing out in three ways, in three E's. One is we're going to lose people to extremism. Second, we're going to lose out on an expansive idea of who we are as individuals and as a community. And thirdly, we're going to really lose out on the economic benefits that proper representation can bring to our economy. Let me just start this first point of extremism. I remember when um, my mom and my sister are here right now, and I remember when we were, uh, when they'd be watching TV downstairs in the lounge, I'd be upstairs, you know, playing my Game Boy or whatever, and all of a sudden I'd hear one of them call out when they're watching TV, Asian! <laughs> <clears throat> and you probably press pause on the Game Boy or turn it off and run downstairs just to go and look at. Sanjeev Bhaskar, goodness gracious me, Mira Sayal, Baji on the beach, Parminder Nagra, Bend It Like Beckham, Jimmy Mystery, East is East. If you're used to seeing yourself reflected in culture, you really, I really want you to take a minute to, to kind of understand how much it means to someone who doesn't to see themselves reflected back. Every time you see yourself in a magazine, in a billboard, TV, film, it's a message that, that you matter you're part of the national story, that you're valued. You feel represented. Now, if we fail to represent people in our mainstream narratives, they'll switch off. They'll retreat to fringe narratives, to filter bubbles online, and sometimes even off to Syria. In the mind of the ISIS recruit, he's a version of James Bond, right? In their mind, everyone thinks they're the good guy. Have you seen some of these ISIS propaganda videos? They're, they're cut like uh, action movies. Where's the counter-narrative? Where are we telling these kids that they can be heroes in our stories, that they're valued? I saw an interesting survey recently. It was a Gallup poll. It was a survey of a billion Muslims, and it took years and years to get done. Um, I'm citing Wajah Ali here. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> It was really interesting. They asked a billion Muslims, what are their key grievances with the quote-unquote West? I have problems with that term. But what, what are their key grievances? And number one was, conversation for another day, uh, you know, the, the disconnect between with the West's stated values and their foreign policy. We'll talk about that another, another day, if you invite me back. Um, <laughs> but number two on their list of grievances was the depiction of Muslims in the media. I mean, that's massive. Of a billion Muslims in the world, that is their number two grievance. This isn't just a signal to give me more acting work. <laughs> it's something that should give us pause and realize how important it is to feel represented. Now, 
That's extremism. It's not just important to show people themselves and to send a signal that they are valued and worthwhile and represented. It's also really important, I think, to show people characters and stories that don't resemble them at all. If we don't, we'll lose out on a second E, an expansive idea of who we are. We've all had this experience, right? Watching a film, TV show, there's a story where there's a, there's a little hero or heroine taking on a massive challenge, insurmountable odds, right? Through a steep learning curve, some hard lessons and uh, noble sacrifices, they just about make it through, save the day, and at the end, maybe even lose their lives. We're in floods of tears. The character we've been watching is a fish. <laughs> or a bunny rabbit. Or an alien. The power of stories to allow us to relate to experiences that don't resemble our own is phenomenal. And every time we see those experiences, it reminds us that what unites us is far, far greater than what divides us. Culture is a place where you can put yourself in someone else's shoes. And a one-size-shoe shop just doesn't make any sense. You know, sociologists, I was taught, uh, define a nation as an imagined community, right? Our community coheres only within the bounds of our imagination, as far as our imagination will stretch. I believe we really need to step up to the plate and push our imagination to be as broad as our community actually is. Just a quick aside, I think some of this is about history. Looking up at this beautiful painting over here, I'm going to assume, is it, is it World War I? World War I, maybe? Um, over a million Indians fought and died for Great Britain in World War I. No one ever taught me that at school. We never learned about the British Empire. We never learned about whose blood, sweat, tears, hopes and fears are baked into the bricks in this building. If we did learn about that, then maybe we wouldn't think about diversity and throwing people crumbs out of politeness. Maybe we'd think about giving people their due and representing them. It was only recently that I learned the first Indian MP was in the 1850s. The first black footballer was in the 1860s. Edward VII had a black trumpeter, ironically named John Blank. And uh, actually, even our England's first border patrol force was a North African legion fighting for the Italian Roman army to keep the Scots on the other side of Hadrian's Wall. So even our anti-immigration movement has been really multicultural for thousands of years. <laughs> That's how deep it goes. So we're missing out. We're losing people to extremism. We're losing an expansive idea of who we are. But most importantly, given the big Brexit bill we're facing that we've got to pay, we're losing out on money. We're losing out on my taxes. I can tell you from my own experience, anecdotally, and David Oyelowo spoke about this recently at the Black Star Symposium. Idris spoke about this last year. We end up going to America to find work. I meet with producers here, meet with directors. I think they're being honest when they say they want to work with me. But they say, we just don't have anything for you. All our stories are set in Cornwall in the 1600s. <laughs> now, <laughs> never mind that Cornwall already had a really busy Indian takeaway at that point. We're just not telling that. I just don't want to tell that story. Um, but it's, it's weird because, I mean, Asians are such a big proportion of the population here, right? It's such a small comparative proportion of the population in America that um, Asian doesn't even mean people that look like me in America. When I go over to the States, they think I'm Hispanic. They talk to me in Spanish. <laughs> then I tell them I'm Asian. They look at me, they see I'm not Chinese, they think I'm crazy. <laughs> and yet it takes American remakes of British shows to cast someone like me. There was a report recently, I think, that Ruby McGrath uh, Smith turned in that Sajid Javid, the MP, commissioned. And um, it was about diversity in our economy as a whole. And what it showed is that if black and minority ethnic professionals, workers, um, were afforded promotion at the same rate and um, with the same frequency as their white counterparts, it could add 24 billion pounds to our economy each year. It's not a zero-sum game. There's room for everyone up there. And if you look at the box office, a study recently in the Bunch Foundation showed that 
The most diversely cast and made films are the ones that do best at the American box office. They just tap into different markets. I think we need to kind of take a leaf out of the book of our music industry. Drum and bass, grime, dubstep, these are world conquering musical genres that are only possible by tapping into our multiculturalism. And just once again to reiterate that this is about the bottom line, the creative industries make up 7% of our GDP, second only to the uh, financial services industries. And we all know how much love they get around here, so throw us a bone, <laughs> and uh, I promise it will pay off. So those are the things we're missing out on if we fail to represent properly. We're losing people to extremism. We're losing out on an expansive idea of who we could be and in the, in the eyes of the world. And we're losing out on the economic benefits. So how are we doing? Well, we've heard some figures already. I won't go into it in too much detail. But I will say this. Sometimes it's very easy to look at the screen and go, oh, look, things are changing so much. Look, there's Reeves, there's Idris, there's Michaela Cole doing chewing gum. These examples are often prominent because they are the exception that proves the rule. Prominent successes can mask structural problems. Obama was in the White House and you still needed the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm getting on a plane to LA to attend the Star Wars premiere and I still get that second search before I board the plane. By the way, if you've never had the experience of uh, being asked for a selfie by someone who's swabbing you for explosives, it's... <laughs> I'd recommend it. It's really quite, quite thrilling. <laughs> Do they love me? Do they hate me? Who's not sure? <laughs> but the statistics do tell a slightly worrying story. The skill set census showed that between 2009 and 2000, 2012, this is kind of crazy to me, um, black and minority ethnic participation in the production of film and television dropped from 10% to 3%. Gains are hard won and we have to fight hard to keep them. Only 1.5% of directors, TV dramas, are from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. For period drama, which we love making so much of, and long may it continue, it's good for our economy as well, the figure is 0%. So it completely shut out from helping to shape our national narrative and the history of who we are. Meanwhile, the participation of people from private schools, such as myself, I got a government assisted place to attend a private school, is 14% when they're 7% of the population. So we've got work to do. How do we improve? I really applaud the measures that you guys have put forwards. But if I look at my own journey, two things jump out at me. One, we need to safeguard the opportunities and access to the creative industries amongst marginalized and underrepresented groups. Yes, this is about mentorship, this is about skills, this is about training. If I look at my own story, got into a private school on a scholarship where my acting was nurtured, got into Oxford, again, that was, that was a big culture shock for me. Actually, when I first arrived at Oxford, <laughs> the first person I met, I knocked on my next door neighbor's door. <laughs> so back in the day, everyone had Nokia charges, right? Everyone had a Nokia. And um, knocked on the door, and thought, I'm put on my best English. Everyone was walking around in bowler hats and bow ties, didn't get the memo about fancy dress. <laughs> and I said, I'm terribly sorry, but um, um, could I please by any chance borrow your, 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 your phone charger if you happen to have a Nokia? And she looked at me and said, oh my God, you remind me so much of Ali G, it's unbelievable. <laughs> so I, I was this close to leaving. I actually, I left, I came back home for a little bit. Somehow, something stubborn in me decided to persevere. As I was leaving Oxford, I wasn't going to apply to drama school, didn't think there was any future in me playing cab driver number two. Somebody encouraged me, I thought, I applied to one drama school. If I don't get in, it's not meant to be. I got in, can't afford the fees. I applied to one scholarship fund. If I don't get it, it's not meant to be. I got it, still couldn't afford the fees. West End Theatre producer Thelma Holt saw me in a play in Oxford, offered to pay and make up some of that gap and fees, and I'm indebted to her to this day. Even as I was leaving drama school, I thought, I'm not represented in the culture, what am I gonna do for a living? At the exact moment, it was the same week I was gonna send in a law conversion course application form, I got plucked from drama school, I had to leave early and had my first film. And that's a big run of luck. And I shudder to think about all the people who fell at just one of those hurdles. 
We need to pre preserve the access and funding in community centers. We need to make sure that the hike in tuition fees doesn't stop people from going to drama school and pursuing careers in the creative industries. Otherwise, we'll all lose. Now, that's the skills and training argument, but there's another argument. One of the other argument is that actually we've got enough people who are skilled and well-trained to hire. It's just a hiring problem. A lot of people, I'm hearing this from a lot of people, anecdotally, what I've seen is actually, this is the case. We all have unconscious bias. Ruby McGrath-Smith's report into our economy as a whole showed that unconscious bias is responsible for stopping career progression of minorities. Now we can train against unconscious bias, or even better, I propose, if you'll humor me, tying public money to proper representation targets so that decision-making rooms, the rooms in which the rooms in which decisions are made are representative of our community, of our nation, and tell a story that represents us all. So that when everyone ends up exercising their unconscious bias, somewhere in the, in the, in the wash, it works out being kind of representative. It just makes sense. Center forwards are valued on how many goals they score. We're in the business of representation. If we don't represent, we've got to go. It's really that simple. That is what we're here to do. I really think that government has to step in here. It's only government that's going to have the long view and see the really, really big picture, which is that what's at stake isn't whether or not you can turn out another hit period drama or whether or not you can open a film in Russia because there aren't any black people on the poster. People making television programs often are trying to turn out a hit and are worried about their jobs in a competitive industry. I get it. It's only when government steps in to set the rules of the game that you will foster true innovation the same way that you do in the arms industry, the same way you do when you support the Olympics and it brings a massive boon to how we're seen around the world. They'll thank you for it in the long run. You won't be handcuffing them to anything. Because what's at stake here is whether or not we can move forwards together. We're really at a very critical moment in our nation's history. You can feel it. If we don't step up and tell a representative story we're going to start losing people. We're going to start losing people to other stories. We're going to start losing British teenagers to the story that the next chapter in their lives is written with ISIS in Syria. We're going to start losing MPs like Joe Cox, who are murdered in the street because we've been sold a story that's so narrow about who we are and who we've been and who we should be. And we're going to lose out on all those taxes I could have paid the Treasury. We're at this critical moment. Let's not allow future generations to look back and judge us when centrifugal forces were threatening to tear us apart, because they really are. I can feel it. I know a lot of you can too. We need you to step up decisively and act. Let's do what's right. Let's represent. Thank you very much.